Hello, I'm Dr. Antonio Colombo from Milano. It's uh, my great pleasure to uh, take part in these uh, sessions. Uh, there are a number of discussants, uh, well-known, uh, uh, experienced. So uh, without uh, wasting any time, uh, let's uh, start uh, this live discussion on uh, different topics and questions posed uh, by the speakers and by the audience. Hi, I'm Alok Finn. I'm here to talk about the magic touch ceramics put a balloon with nanolith technology, preclinical insights and rationale. Here are my disclosures. So when we take, talk about the Seralmus drug-coated balloon, I think we're talking about where it fits in 60 years of coronary progress. You can see here that we have made significant progress in terms of device evolution and treatment evolution from then until now. And I think the drug-coated balloon, it represents the pinnacle of this evolution. Now we have to understand where use of drug loading extends, but drug-coated balloons are a very different sort of device. We, instead of using a polymer to deliver drug, we must transfer that drug and have it to be sustained in the arterial wall during the time of inflation, which is a very tricky task rather than putting it on a stent and eluding it from a polymer. So the devices and the makeup of these drug coated balloons are very different from drug eluding stents. Well, what's important in terms of an effective DCB formulation? Well, certainly, as I mentioned before, we need to deliver large quantities of the drug within seconds and make it stay there over four weeks long. We must, it must also allow for rapid healing. Uh, we must have no toxicity and we must be able to see biologic effects at 28 days in an animal model. Also, we do not want that drug to go down to non-target areas and be delivered to areas where we won't, don't want the drug. So, so far with drug-coated balloons, we've been mainly dominated by paclitaxel uh, drug-coated balloons, which deliver a crystalline form of paclitaxel, which forms a depot and deposits over time, uh, causing sustained drug release. But the problem with paclitaxel coated balloons, one of the problems is coating integrity. It's very hard to get that coating to be very firmly adhered to the balloon and not go into downstream areas. So why do we need a Stralmus DCB? Well, we've shown with paclitaxel DCBs, there are significant amounts of drug that go downstream into skeletal muscle beds, for instance, the porcine peripheral model, which uh, are then delivered to non-target sites and cause issues with uh, um, uh, inflammation in non-target areas. Uh, in addition, that crystalline paclitaxel can go downstream and cause slow flow in coronary beds, which are documented in these two papers, and uh, coronary flow reserve can be impaired as well. So Seralmus offers potential benefits over paclitaxel. It's well known that it is a dominant mode drug used in, in the coronary. It's very effective at inhibiting muscle cell proliferation and migration, and its safety margin is simply very much superior to that of Paclitaxel 10,000 fold versus 100 fold. Of course, the problems are tissue absorption and retention are much more difficult with Seralimus. The Magic Touch solution is a Seralimus coated DCB, which, in which the Seralimus is delivered uh, in phospholipid nanoparticles over the course of the 60 second balloon inflation. And really this overcomes the problems of Seralimus coated balloons. It seems to enhance tissue absorption as well as extend tissue retention. I'll show you data for this in the next few slides. You can see here, when we look at the ratio of free to encapsulate Seralimus in an animal model, we have a lot more free uh, Seralimus initially, and then we have less free at 28 days, whereas the level of encapsulated Seralimus at seven and 20 days really isn't different, showing you it does form a drug depot, which is sustained over time. And this is shown in the arterial wall uh, pharmacokinetic levels, which basically show sustained release of serolimus in, in uh, porcine coronary arteries out to 60 days, which is exactly what we'd like to have. Now, how do we show the effectiveness of the balloon? This is a porcine ISR model, which is used to study uh, this, uh, this balloon. Here we can see at day zero, we do vessel injury and put a bare metal stent into the animal. At day 28, we come back later and we treat that bare metal stent restenosis with either a DCB or a plain old balloon, and we sacrifice the animals 28 days later and look at tissue and organ analysis. You can see here in the study that was done using the Magic Touch balloon versus POVA, significantly 
uh, good healing at 28 days in an ISR model. Really no no difference between the magic touch and the POVA in terms of restenotic rate, which is probably be expected given it's a low injury model. However, we do show significant increase in, in uh, struts with fibrin shown here at the 28 day porcine ISR model. You can see significantly more fibrin for the magic touch versus POVA indicating successful drug delivery. Now, there were no differences. I mentioned neonal area and uh, percent stenosis, which is probably expected in this low injury model. In addition, we looked at downstream myocardium to see whether there was incidence of myocardial infarction, and there was no incidence of myocardial infarction in either group, in the either POBA or the magic touch balloon group. And we didn't see any evidence of significant microscopic scarring only in two downstream microbial sections in the magic touch and three from POBA, indicating there was really no significant downstream emboli and no direct visual evidence of downstream emboli. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that serolimus is a preferred drug for intravascular interventions. I think everyone would agree with that. Paclitaxel coated balloons are limited by a high rate of distal embolization and loss of paclitaxel into the body. And these concerns were only heightened by the analysis of Katsanos published a few years ago. The magic touch serolimus coated balloon demonstrated successful drug transfer to the arterial wall out to 60 days with no evidence of, uh, with evidence of drug effect and no toxicity. Downstream emboli were minimal in the current coronary ISR study presented here. I would say this is a promising study for uh, promising device for uh, coronary and PAD interventions. Thank you. So Aloki, I think now it is time for discussion and uh, I, have a, I have a question for you. If, yeah. I, if, I'm, yeah, yeah. if I'm right. Um, so, do you think that uh, uh, serolimus, by means of uh, uh, the nanolute technology, uh, may have completely overcome the limitation of this drug in terms of uh, lipophilia and so penetration uh, into the, into the vessel wall? From your animal experience, what, what do you think? Look, I think that it's a it's a good first generation product. Uh, just like we have with uh, first-generation DES. We're going to make improvements. We're going to extend drug release. We're going to make uh, intimal formation, the amount of intimal emission even less. So the technology will continue to improve. But I think as a, as a first start, as a beginning, I think it's a very good product in terms of demonstrating uh, it's sustained tissue relief of serolimus without significant toxicity to the arterial wall. So I'm pretty happy with the, the product so far, Bernardo. Bernardo, I'd also, uh, we got a question through the chat and I'd like to pose this to everybody if we have time. Can serolimus coated balloons make side branch treatment simplified in bifurcation PCI and also in 010 osteo LAD lesions with uh, SCB placed simultaneously while deploying the LAD osteo DES? What's your experience? I guess Dr. Colombo, Bernardo, Azim, what do you think about though, that comment? Of course, if you do not have a stent, uh access to the side branch is easier, but uh, there are limited data to really prove uh, efficacy in, in bifurcations, but uh, theoretically uh, should, be, should be better because uh, you have less uh, uh, carina shift uh, in one direction or the other. Azim, you want to add anything? I know you had something to say. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's a very, for me, appealing approach to think about using a drug coated balloon, especially a serolimus coated balloon, uh, in side branches when you don't want to stent the side branch. Um, particularly, I mean, you know, when you do a provisional and the side branch looks, looks perfect, I don't think you need to do anything, right? But when you have those, a little bit of disease, you know, you have to kiss. It still doesn't look great. I, for me, it's very appealing to to try and avoid two stents and a bifurcation if you can. I like the idea, and particularly like the left main bifurcation, you know, yeah. with the circumflex. If you can avoid putting stents in the circumflex ostium, I think we do patients a favor. Yeah, I, I agree. Should we move on to the next talk? Um, the next lecture is by uh, Dr. Cortese, the Eastbourne Registry. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to present the clinical program for the Magic Touch BCB in the coronary array. I'm really proud to present you not only the Eastburn study, but also all of, of the advancement that have been done with this device in the last five years. 
So this is my potential conflict of interest. So what are we looking from uh, uh, a new DCB when we want uh, to try? First of all, we need to have an improved deliverability and the trackability in order to use it also in complex lesions. This is something that is very important, also considering the advancements that have been done with the drug eluting stents. And then what do we need? We need an adequate preclinical program, and we need to see the data uh, either for the acute efficacy of this device in delivering the drug, and then at least a minimum one month of uh, uh, persistence on the drug. We need to see how the drug is in the blood, how the drug is in the treated artery and in the surrounding parts of the artery, how is it in the myocardium and in other vital organs. This is very important. And then after this, we need also a robust clinical program in order for us to understand the safety and the efficacy of this device uh, in a broad spectrum of uh, uh, patients, complex patients. And then we want to, to see how it is going in a complex lesion setting as compared to drug eluting stents. So we're going to see how this device uh, has fared in the last few years uh, regarding the last two points. So what is uh, a, 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 the, the, the history of a reliability of a device in terms of clinical efficacy? Uh, we need, first of all, as I said, to have in vitro studies and then animal studies. Uh, and Aloki has already shown how uh, Magic Touch is performing in this setting. And then we started back in 2016 with the first studies, uh, first series of consecutive patients with Fasico and Fasico natives in native vessel disease. Then we went uh, uh, with an indirect comparison with paclitaxel coated balloons in the CIRPAC study. And then we needed more data regarding a registry. So we are here with the Eastbourne registry. What else? What else? We need also randomized clinical trials. And one of them, the mechanistic study, the first one is Transform 1, uh, which uh, I, will, I will be talking about uh, in a little bit. And then we also need large clinical trials. Transform 2 and Picoletto 3 will go through this item. So uh, I was mentioning CIRPAC. CIRPAC is the first indirect comparison between Sirolimus and paclitaxel coated balloons. 1,090 patients uh, were enrolled from the DCB RISE and the Eastbourne registries. After propensity matching, we enrolled 580 patients. You can see that after propensity matching, the propensity score was adequate for all of our uh, evaluations about these two type of devices. We have a one-year follow-up for this, as you can see, either from the couple of cubes for maces and for death, and also for the, uh, um, the slide, the, this left part of the slide, that there is no significant differences between these two types of devices in terms of clinical performance after one year. And then I was mentioning randomized clinical data. The first study, the first mechanistic study is Transform 1. Transform 1 will randomize patients with native vessel disease up to 2.75 to two different strategies. But what is interesting is that this PCI will be based on OCT angiography immediately and then OCT just to size correctly the dimensions of the DCB that we're going to use. This is a multi-center study of centers with, from Italy and from the UK with a core lab. And patients with native vessel disease up to 2.75 will be randomized between sequent please and magic touch. Then we will do the OCT and we will uh, treat the patient uh, with a truck or the balloon PCI. QCA at six months will allow us to understand uh, if there is no differences between these two strategies and the primary endpoint uh, is net room and diameter gain, where we hypothesize the non-inferiority between magic touch and sequent please. We have enrolled uh, so far 12 patients. So the, the study just recently started enrolling patients. Now uh, we are just speeding up this part of the enrollment, uh, uh, being able to enroll uh, five patients in the last 10 days. 
And then we go to transform two disease a randomized clinical trial with the clinical follow-up. This is the extraordinary steering committee which will uh, lead this study. Transform two will enroll patients with native vessel disease between 2O and 3O by visual estimation. We will prepare corrected the lesion. And then in case we don't have a flow-limited dissection, we will randomize patients either to a verolimus saluting stent or magic touch. And then we will go to the 12-month clinical follow-up with a primary endpoint of TLF, where we hypothesize the non-inferiority between these two different strategies. And we follow up the patients up to five years just to see if after the first year there will be a, also an improvement from a clinical point of view with a DCB PCI. The status of transform 2, we have not started enrolling patients yet. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to start enrolling patients in the next uh, three to four months, but we are ready to the activation of the main centers from these interventional, international, multi-centers, randomized clinical study. And then we come to Eastbourne. Eastbourne was designed three years ago, and this is a no camera registry it's a prospective registry, multi-center, multinational, open label, and what is important to uh, underline, investigator level registry. So all consecutive patients which will be treated by uh, magic touch in these centers will be enrolled with the aim of reaching 2,000 patients and a primary endpoint will be TLR at 12 months and we will follow our patients up to three years. We will also have some uh, pre-specified cohort analysis for uh, small vessel disease, instant restenosis, acute coronary syndromes, and so on. So far, we have finished enrollment in November 2020 for a total of 2,123 patients, and this will be the largest study ever on DCB in the coronary field. This is the main characteristic of the population. We have 40% of diabetics, and we have multivessel disease in 56% of the patients. You can see that from the clinical point of view, the population is really broad. Uh, in about half of the cases, we have stable coronary artery disease, and in 44, 45% of the cases, we have an acute coronary syndrome. From the lesion point of view, we have de novo lesions in more than 50% of the cases, and also this is a news as compared to other registries. Instant restenosis is less than 50%. But here, differently from other registries with pancreatic acid coated balloons, the pattern of instant restenosis is more complex because more than 50% of the cases do not have, do not share a focal instant restenosis, but a complex instant restenosis with 7% of the cases with an occlusive instant restenosis. And here, again, differently from other studies, uh, the vast majority of the patients have a drug eluting stent in stent restenosis. From the lesion and procedural characteristics, predilatation was performed in 93% of the cases, and the need for stenting was pretty low, only 7% of the cases. Uh, I'm not going to share the data, the clinical follow up uh, for interim analysis. There are it has been already published for the first cohort of patients, but I'm going to tell you that uh, after one year, only 46% of the patients were still on DAPT. And uh, this is important just to underline the importance of a drug coated balloon, which do not require a prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy. So, in conclusion, DCBs are a major player now in interventional cardiology. Sirenus coated balloon, magic touch has been has shown to have consistent data in terms of immediate performance, deliverability, trackability. A clinical program which was started back in 2016 is still ongoing and is very robust, more than any other type of drug coated balloon so far. Thank you for your attention. That was great. I think we have time now for about three minutes of questions. Um, I'll ask the first one to uh, the panelists. How much, you know, U.S., we don't have the DCB, obviously. We're not accustomed to doing the kind of studies you're talking about. We don't have approvals yet. 
how much of the DCB result is a result of technique and how much of the DCB result is a result of the balloon? You all have a lot of experience in clinical use with this. What's your feeling? Well, uh, look, yes, the, we learned this uh, back uh, 15 years ago, that uh, it is a matter of, of the device that you're using. This is important. Currently, I have to admit that many devices that were out uh, are not there anymore. Uh, so the quality, the average quality uh, was improved, but uh, it is still a matter of how you use a DCB. So uh, lesion preparation is uh, really crucial. And since we are using DCBs not in type A or B1 lesions, but we are using it uh, with stents in very complex lesions, uh, I have to say that we should use any type of device that we have in our cath lab, including uh, rotablation, uh, shockwave, or whatever, in order to prepare the lesion uh, correctly. For example, we use a lot of scoring balloons in our clinical practice because the lesion setting is very complex, and here it is uh, mostly important uh, to correctly prepare the lesion. Any other comments? There was a question, Bernardo. You know, when you're you're doing you're showing some data with de novo, um, and uh, well, first of all, you know, de novo lesions is a question about one to one balloon size versus what size is the appropriate size DCB in terms of the reference vessel diameter. Uh, what what do you think? And then the other thing, there's another question regarding complex lesions. How do you all view the use of DCBs de novo for de novo complex lesions, calcified, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. This is a recurrent question. Uh, this time, I, I will uh, I will have a, a different answer. Um, consensus documents uh, say that it is preferable to have a ratio between zero point and one o to the vessel size. But I have to say, in our experience, we are not very aggressive in uh, obtaining a, a, an almost perfect. Uh, uh, um, angiographic success before the use of DCB because we know that in the complex setting we uh, may incur in large dissections, okay? I'm talking about complex lesions, obviously. Uh, and so we want to avoid uh, to put too many stents. So uh, for this reason, in many cases with very long lesions, tapered vessels, uh, uh, we are using a 0 0.8 ratio to the vessel size. But in case of a simple lesion, obviously one-to-one -one is okay. Anybody else want to add anything? Should we go to the uh, live recorded case that we're falling a little bit behind, three minutes behind? Can we go for the recorded case from Humanitas Hospital in Milan? I am uh, Dr. Antonio Colombo, and it is my pleasure to present you this uh, case from uh, Humanitas Research Hospital in uh, Rozzano, Milano. Uh, utilizing uh, what we can define uh, a new technique of uh, PCI guided uh, by pressure wire with a drug-coated uh, balloon. Uh, we are dealing uh, with a 66-year-old lady, uh, no particular risk factors. The patient came to our attention uh, as a pre-op evaluation for a procedure of for acute cholecystitis. Uh, patient has uh, an history of shortness of breath and fatigue, a little bit out of disproportion for her habitus. In addition, there is uh, uh, inverted uh, T waves uh, across the precordial leads. Uh, the uh, evaluation at this point demanded uh, uh, coronary CT that uh, showed the calcification on the proximal LAD uh, with possible significant stenosis uh, leading uh, to a coronary angiogram. Now we go to the coronary angiogram, which shows the right coronary artery, which is dominant uh, without a significant disease. Uh, the left anterior descending, uh, in the cranial uh, view uh, shows uh, a long narrowing, doesn't, doesn't appear much critical, but is uh, quite long and diffuse, uh, with another narrowing after the uh, big diagonal branch. You will see uh, two views, uh, areocranial and uh, uh, leocranial. Uh, going into more detail in this uh, still frame, uh, 
uh, you see uh, the more uh, diffuse narrowing, which uh, almost discrete in the proximal LAD, and uh, the discrete narrowing after the diagonal branch. Um, nothing really dramatic, and that's the reason why we decided to do PDPA and FFR evaluation. In addition, you see the frames of the IVUS, uh, which shows uh, uh, calcifications and uh, a distal vessel, which is free of disease, uh, 2.5 in size, uh, with uh, uh, calcifications, especially in the frame in red, where there is uh, the most uh, significant uh, lesion. Also, the one uh, on the right side in the middle shows uh, uh, significant narrowing. So at this point, uh, we are dealing with possible critical lesions, but we have no confirmation. We uh, also evaluate uh, the proximal LAD, which shows in one segment a significant narrowing. Other than that, there is some diffuse disease, but in my view, nothing is critical by, by IVUS. Now we go to the uh, bottom line, which is uh, assessment of the baseline uh, FFR or pressure drop. And with the guide wire distal, uh, you almost don't need any number because when you see these uh, two tracing, uh, you see that the distal one is uh, ventricular in uh, shape. So it's, uh, it's positive for reduction of flow. We have a PDPA of uh, 0 0.77, and when you have a PDPA of 0 0.77, you don't need adenosine, you don't need IFR, you just need uh, uh, the conscience that this uh, disease is critical. So uh, after this introduction and having determined that this patient has a critical disease in the proximal and mid LAD, uh, we decided uh, to treat uh, uh, this uh, lady because uh, the amount of territory by these ischemic lesions, two lesions, uh, is not small and uh, definitely is more than 10% of the myocardium. Now let's go to what we did as far as the intervention are concerned. So now we enter into the core of the procedure. We have two wires, one pressure wire to monitor what's going on and one working wire. This is the LED in the cranial. First, we predilate the more distal lesion with a 2.5 high pressure balloon. We go usually at 20, 22 atmosphere until we see full expansion of the balloon. The balloon is Okay, it's not super full expansion, but I believe when we go to maximum pressure, like here, the balloon is fully expanded. Of course, the distal wire monitors that the balloon is occluding the artery because you don't see any pressure distally. So we have dilated the, the proximal lesion first. Following the predilatation of the more distal lesion, we now proceed to predilate uh, the more uh, proximal lesion with the uh, area of diffuse disease. We use a trio balloon, non-compliant, inflated at 24 atmosphere. The balloon here gets well expanded. The IVUS shows some calcification, but not dramatic. So the old proximal segment is dilated at 22 atmosphere with a trio non-compliant balloon. So in summary, we have dilated the distal with a 2.5 high pressure and the diffuse long lesion proximally with a trio high pressure balloon. So now, after this procedure, we evaluate the FFR and the PDPA. Let's see also an angiogram and see what, uh, what we have done after the predilatation. Let's continue the predilatation up to the very end. Various uh, uh, segments are dilated with uh, uh, sustained about 20 seconds each, uh, each dilatation. 
patient is tolerating uh, this procedure uh, quite well. So you see that the uh, balloon stays up. Now the balloon goes up and down just to double check uh, that there's no obstruction. And now we uh, measure the distal pressure and uh, we, take, uh, we take an angiogram. Be patient with us until you see uh, the angiogram, which is coming. With a uh, distal wire, we don't really take many angiograms because uh, we know what's going on from, uh, uh, from the distal pressure. But uh, uh, let me go uh, directly to the angiogram in order to save some time. So as uh, I promised, uh, we now get the angiogram. Uh, again, when you have the distal pressure, it becomes stingy with the angiogram. But uh, here is the angiogram. I think uh, we'll get a better injection in a moment. Okay, here we get. So the result is uh, it's fine. There is no, no particular dissection. In one segment, uh, maybe there is 20-30% uh, residual. But uh, overall, I would say the result uh, is acceptable for balloon. It's not acceptable for stenting, of course, but uh, uh, be with us. We did not implant a stent. So this so at this point, uh, we go to the key aspect of this procedure, which is uh, to evaluate uh, the distal uh, pressure. The PDPA with the wire very distal shows uh, a value of 0 0.94, basically a gradient only 6, uh, with an IFR of 0.8. But again, the wire is very distal. So this means that the lesions are really non-obstructive. Maybe 0 0.8 is not perfect, but uh, I wish we implanted a stent to see what we have, uh, we, we had obtained. I'm not so sure that we would obtain anything better than 0 0.8. Again, PDPA 0 0.94, stable. Stable means that we wait two or three minutes and the 94 stays, as a matter of fact, sometimes become 0, 95, 96. So the flow is persistently good. At this point, we decide not to implant the stent, and we start our uh, therapeutic uh, drug delivery with drug-coated balloon. So at this point, uh, in consideration of the stable uh, PDPA, uh, we decide to deliver a drug in the distal lesion first with a trio balloon. We predilected with the 2.5. We have seen that this vessel is large, so we can go with the trio balloon. Not very high pressure, 8, 9. We just want to deliver the drug. A trio inflated the 8 atmosphere, a 20 in length is a magic touch, a Sirolimus delivery balloon and is kept inflated at least one minute. After deflation of the balloon, we check again the PDPA to make sure that uh, the value of 94 is stable and does not deteriorate. As a matter of fact, following this dilatation, sometimes the PDPA goes up to 96. Uh, so here you see the balloon fully expanded. At this point, uh, we deliver the drug proximally. We use a 3.5, 40 millimeter drug coated balloon. It's the long area which has been instrumented before. And uh, it's a 3.5 inflated uh, at uh, 8 atmosphere, so we don't want to disrupt the vessel uh, and to create any big dissection. The balloon is now inflated. Eight atmosphere for at least uh, 45 seconds, one minute. And uh, you will notice that the balloon uh, expands uh, fully. If the balloon does not expand fully, uh, is uh, a problem in the predilatation because uh, we, this 
procedure is not meant to dilate the vessel. This procedure is meant to deliver the drug. So this balloon is just a drug delivery balloon. If the lesion is not well prepared, we don't go to the drug delivery balloon. Bear this in mind. We keep the pressure wire distally to monitor what's happened because you can disrupt the vessel with this balloon and make the distal flow deteriorate. If this is the case, you go and cross over to implant a stent. But this is not happening in this case. But if this happens, uh, you have to remove the pressure wire, implant the stent, and reevaluate with the pressure wire after stent implantation. Here you see the balloon fully inflated, kept inflated for one minute. Following uh, uh, the inflation of the two drug delivery balloon, uh, distal and proximally, we repeat an angiogram, and more importantly, we recheck the PDPA which uh, most probably thanks to the better dilatation made uh, by the drug coated balloon, the PDPA goes from 94 to 98, which is a remarkable improvement, and the IFR goes from 0.8 to 0.84. So we are really uh, safe because uh, these numbers not only improved, but they stay stable. Uh, they change, but they change toward improvement, not toward deterioration. If they change toward deterioration, then it's time to consider stenting. If they change towards improvement, it's time to be uh, relaxed and accept the drug-coated balloon approach. Now we go to the angiogram, the final angiograms. Basically, they are not essential but, uh, of course, we are angiographers, so, so we like to see the angiogram as well, and uh, we take uh, some final projections. But from the practical point of view, the procedure is over now. So, as I said, uh, we take uh, final shots. Uh, you see the RAO and the LAO cranial with uh, good lumen. There is... Uh, maybe some linear dissection, more visible in the area, but uh, the dye is completely clear, and the lumen is not uh, uh, collapsed by the dissection, and more important, uh, PDPA is stable. Uh, we also repeat uh, uh, the IVUS. Uh, you see a steel frame here with uh, the IVUS. Uh, the lumen is not a stent lumen, because we did not implant the stent, but uh, the plaque is broken, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, thanks to the drug, Sirolimus, delivered by the Magic Touch uh, drug coated balloon, uh, should uh, favor a positive remodeling of the vessel. Uh, the bottom line will be the angiogram uh, in uh, six, uh, uh, nine months, and uh, you will have to be patient, and we will show you the angiogram uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the IVUS distally is a 2.5 vessel, and the IVUS proximally shows a 3.5 vessel with uh, uh, asymmetry uh, due to the uh, calcium uh, in the mid IVUS frame. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the uh, lumen is quite large, even if asymmetric. You see here the IVUS of the more proximal segment uh, with uh, a very large lumen and less plaque except uh, uh, some calcium which is fractured in one uh, of the IVUS uh, frames. The conclusions and the take-home message of this case is that coronary dissections uh, does not mandatory involve the use of stent. Uh, the uh, hemodynamic impairment of a dissection of a residual stenosis is evaluated by measurement of pressure gradient, PDPA. If the pressure gradient, in our experience, is over 10, I would say sometimes even over 5, uh, we proceed uh, to stenting. Otherwise, we leave the result as it is. 
personally, I do not sponsor the approach to use a DCB in the context of a dissection unless you evaluate the distal residual pressure. It's not a must to evaluate the distal residual pressure. Conclusions, Etecon message. Uh, coronary dissection uh, does not mandatory involve the implantation of a stent. The eventual impairment of a dissection or a residual stenosis should be evaluated by measurement of the residual pressure gradient, PDPA. We usually put the cut at 10, but we prefer in general to be a little bit more severe and give the cut at 5 mm of mercury. If we see a pressure gradient over these values, we are not titubant uh, uh, to implant a stent. Uh, we are not against the stent, but we only want to use the stent if needed. If there is a dissection, we prefer not to go to drug coated balloon unless we have evaluated this dissection with the PDPA. If there is no dissection and the result is pristine, I do not believe you need to do PDPA all the time. PDPA is only needed if the result is questionable or if there is some lumen impairment or some dissection. Great, that's fantastic. I have a bunch of questions I need to ask uh, all of the, the uh, panels. The, the chat box is just blowing up. So I wanna make sure I get all of these questions. I want you all to chime in, please. There's a lot of procedural issues or questions around the DCB use, and I need to get specific with you guys. My uh, first question is Eastbourne, how long do you stay up with a DCB? And then somebody else asked, you routinely under dilate during lesion preparation, you did in this case, what max pressure do you use for a DCB inflation? That's question number two. And the last question I'm gonna ask you is, when do you know you need to use a stent after, DC, after uh, your initial pre-dilatation and when do you decide to use the DCB? Um, so those are the three questions. If you guys can uh, chime in on that, I would really appreciate it. Sandeep, you go. Yeah. Okay, so Sandeep, give, us some, give us some words of wisdom. Thanks, Alok. Um, I think, look, uh, sizing of the uh, DCB should be based on your uh, angiographic uh, assessment. So if you're doing an IVAS, fine, you get probably a bigger measurement. But we, when a routine clinical use, I only use a one-to-one -one, uh, balloon sizing for the DCB. And if you're using one-to-one, -one, you don't need to go beyond the seven or eight atmosphere, as Dr. Colombo was alluding, because if you overinflate your DCB, you are impairing a, a drug transfer theoretically. So you just want to touch the wall with the balloon so that the drug can be transferred. So I normally use seven or eight atmosphere, unless if I'm using a, a four millimeter DCB in a five millimeter vessel where you have to make the balloon bigger, I go higher pressure. So otherwise I normally just stick to seven or eight atmosphere. And the other question you asked about, when do you decide to press DCB or a stand? Look, after pre-dilatation, it is important you assess. If you've got a flow limiting dissection, like a type C or more, or if you've got a recoil of more than 50%, it is not recommendable to go with a DCB. Either you go back with more region preparation if there's a recoil, or you go for a stand if there's a dissection. But if there is a simple type A or type B dissection, you can still use DCB because when you inflate DCB for a minute, you are sealing the dissection. Yeah. The most important thing is after you use a DCB, don't take so many pictures. You just need two shots, one shot to ensure there's no dissection, maybe one viral shot, because more in injection you do, you're propagating the dissection. This is what my practice is. Do you agree, Bernardo and uh, Zim? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, and if I may add uh, two items. The first one uh, is that we had to relearn or to learn how to do a, a, a POBA, okay? Uh, when we afford, when we started doing uh, DCB PCIs. And so when I, when I teach my fellows and my young colleagues, uh, uh, which uh, are accustomed to inflate stents very fast, okay, deflate and go, and go out. No, this is another type of PCI. You have to take your time to inflate slowly because you want to avoid the dissection. Don't go uh, at uh, too much higher uh, uh, pressures. Don't be based on uh, IVUS, for example, media to media. Forget all of this uh, with the DCB because it is a, a delivery system, but it is simple balloon. 
Uh, and the other point, uh, in order also to avoid uh, uh, acute closure, which is very rare, in my opinion, you should also assess the final result after five, and if you have time, 10 minutes from uh, the, last, uh, the last inflation. Azim, anything you want to add? Or Dr. Bossi is also on. She's got a lot of experience with Eastbourne. I know that. So anything to add, either of you? Let's let Irene add something. Irene, you're on mute. Irene, you take yourself off mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we got you. Oh, okay. Um, sorry for the inconvenience. Oh, oh. Well, I, I totally agree with Sandy Bernardo. Uh, coming back to the uh, indication for, let's say, stent after um, a procedure with the balloon, I go back with my first year of experience at Professor Marco in Toulouse, where we wait about 15 minutes after balloon dilation for the elastic recoil. If the elastic recoil was more than 30% in absence of dissection, this was an indication for stent. So before applying the drug, whatever drug with the DCB, and in case of a, a procedure, not in stent stenosis, but in a de novo lesion, I wait uh, 10 minutes and then I check the angio before accepting the results. If no elastic recoil and no dissection, then I apply the, coat, the, 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 the drugs and uh, I complete my... Procedure. Irene, there was one more question for you in Eastbourne. I know you were a major enroller. Um, how long did you stay up with the balloon, um, with the drug-coated balloon? What was your practice? We we always wait 60 minutes, 60, 60 seconds, minutes. sorry, one minute. <laughs> no, that's too much, 60 seconds. I want to get to one more question, oh. then I got to move on to the next lecture. Uh, one more question is all about duration of DAP. Can you guys quickly comment on what you guys do in clinical practice with these balloons? What is your use in terms of patient HBR patients, et cetera? How long do you use the DAP? Well, it depends. Yeah. It's me. Depends on the, the clinical situation. If the indication for a prolonged DAPT depends on the uh, acute coronary syndrome, then it would be in 12 months. But if I'm using the drug coating balloon to, for example, an oncologic patient or any other high bleeding risk patient, well, it's much safer to me to interrupt the DAPT early. So I keep it just for maybe also, maybe only a week sometimes. Great. Great answer. Okay, let's move to the next lecture so we can keep going. Um, the next lecture is how good is magic touch in the treatment of patients with ACS with selfie registry? Patrick Casano is going to present that. Hi, everybody. I'm Gianluca Cagliazzo from Naples, Italy. Uh, let me thank Euro PCR Organizing Committee and Consent Medical for the kind invitation. I'm really happy and honored to be here in a session where uh, pioneers and mentors in the field of interventional cardiology are also present. I'm really pleased to share with you the results of the selfie registry, a study where the magic touch sideline coated balloon was used for the treatment of coronary lesions in acute coronary syndrome patients. I have no conflict of interest for this talk. Uh, let me uh, um, start with a, a couple of comments as background. Uh, the sentence we need stents to prevent acute and subacute vascular occlusion uh, has been a cornerstone in the last 20 to 30 years in uh, interventional cardiology. And of course, it's true, but we should also admit that uh, it could be considered partly true if we think that stents became safe by the introducing of dual implantary therapy and by optimizing the implantation technique, as clearly shown by the mentors that we have also here today, like Dr. Colombo and Dr. Leon, in their studies in the 90s. And uh, another comment uh, to uh, highlight the possibility to uh, consider uh, the drug-coated balloon technology as a a useful tool um, in, in uh, coronary interventions is also uh, this one that uh, it, it has been always appealing the possibility that a, a coronary uh, artery vessel 
uh, go for uh, will go for positive remodeling uh, without uh, a cage, a metal cage, uh, like uh, uh, described uh, by this historical work uh, by Glago et al. Um, in this historical work. So these are uh, some of the reasons why we are believers in the DCB technology. And uh, we designed the self-registry, a single center investigator initiated uh, study uh, focused on acute coronary syndrome patients. The primary endpoint was angiographic procedure, procedural success defined as final diameter stenosis less than 50% with a timetry flow. And the secondary endpoint was uh, maces at longest follow-up available. Uh, we included in the registry uh, all patients older than 18 years old uh, undergoing PCI for acute coronary syndrome. And uh, among the exclusion criteria, we have best cell dimensions exceeding, exceeding those of the device tested or uh, balloon sizes not available at the moment of the procedure. But, but most importantly, we excluded for, um, from our uh, registry all patients uh, presenting with the novel lesions located within the left main or proximal epicardial main vessels. Uh, why uh, using uh, magic touch? Well, uh, colleagues much, much more skilled than me uh, have described this device today in this session. So I will go uh, fast on that just to highlight how interesting is this technology with a lipid-based carrier that encapsulates the drug and allows high tissue penetration and the retention of the drug itself, where tissue penetration and drug retention were the main drawbacks of uh, the Cyrolimus-based devices until now. And why focusing on ACS? Well, the first reaction to this question could be, why not? But let me argument on this. Uh, I think that until uh, to, to date, uh, we have a lack of evidence in this specific, uh, in this specific subset uh, of uh, patients with the magic touch uh, Cyrolimus coated balloon. So uh, we decided to focus on ACS patients also because we strongly believe that some of these patients, especially young STEMI patients, could, could be an ideal subset of patients were to be treated with the uh, uh, drug-coated balloons. And uh, I share with you here a couple of uh, paradigmatic examples uh, just to highlight this concept. This is a total thrombotic occlusion of the proximal posterior lateral branch of the RCA in a patient with inferior STEMI. Uh, we treated the lesion with a 2.25 NC balloon and then with a, a 2.25 by 30 millimeters mag magic touch with a with this final angiographic result uh, that is really uh, good and uh, uh, almost tent-like, if you want. This is another example, it's very, sim uh, very similar, a thrombotic total occlusion of the first diagonal uh, in a patient presented with lateral STEMI. We treated the lesion with a 2.25 NC balloon and then with a magic touch 2.25 by 30 millimeters with this final angiographic result uh, almost tent-like. So where you don't have a heavy calcification, I think uh, uh, this technology works very well also in uh, ACS patients like this uh, that I showed you now. Uh, let's move to population characteristics just to show you that this is a real world uh, registry uh, where 40% of patients were diabetic and 61% uh, of them had a previous MI and 23% of patients had a ST elevated myocardial infarction as clinical presentation. Among proce procedural characteristics, uh, we have a 69% of lesions located in small vessels. Uh, the, we performed predilation in all but one patient, and uh, we achieved an angiographic success that was the primary endpoint uh, in all patients. And here you have the clinical outcome, outcome and at uh, a mean follow-up of 11 months, uh, where the incidence of MACE is 4.8%, TLR and MI 3.2%, cardiovascular death and acute thrombosis 1.6% with no bleedings at all. Um, I think uh, these uh, results uh, could be uh, considered very reassuring and very similar to uh, those of uh, previous studies with this uh, kind of uh, device, uh, taking into account that, this, uh, that these results are obtained in a high-risk population of patients with uh, acute coronary syndromes. Uh, 
And uh, although uh, the small uh, sample size, we uh, decided to perform a sub-analysis to evaluate the incidence of MACE between de novo uh, versus instant wrist stenotic lesions, and we couldn't find uh, any significant significant uh, difference uh, between the two groups, as you see in this graph. So uh, my take home um, are that Magic Touch represents an, eff an effective device for the treatment of coronary uh, lesions, and we know it today. Um, the Selfie Registry uh, was the first investigator initiated uh, study with Magic Touch in uh, a population of ACS patients only, uh, and confirmed the safety and the effectiveness of this device in uh, such a complex clinical setting uh, with a special focus uh, on instant tristenosis and uh, uh, lesions located in uh, small vessels. Of course, all the limitations of a, a small uh, registry can be applied to our study and our findings should be, of course, confirmed in larger studies with uh, clinical endpoints. Thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic. I'm gonna ask Azim a question quickly because he hasn't said anything, which is unusual. Um, Azim, there's a lot of questions in the chat box about uh, whether we can be confident the vessels are going to stay open, whether we can be confident there's no micro dissections. Can people be same day discharged after DCB? How long do you have to leave the sheath in? Uh, so on and so forth. Can you comment on your periprocedural care of these patients and, and how you deal with all of that aspect of it? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I fully understand people's concerns. I mean, as someone who's in ever drug coated balloon user and believer, it's it's a mindset change to start using drug coated balloons, right? Because we were all trained in our training that dissections are bad. And if we leave dissections, we're gonna get acute vessel closures and patients are gonna get infarcts and die, right? Uh, and who wants a lawsuit because you left a dissection? Um, so I think people are rightly concerned. And, and even between us on this panel, we don't all agree. I personally, uh, would have stented the proximal LAD in Antonio's life case uh, and slept better that night. Okay. Uh, and, you know, there are different approaches to doing this. So one of the things we have realized, though, is that even though we're concerned about acute vessel closure, the, the rate of acute vessel closure has been really low. Okay. Much lower than any of us could have imagined or predicted. Uh, why is that? Um, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think the one is because DAPT is much better than it was 20, 30 years ago when we were doing POBA. Okay, we now have really good DAPT, which prevents acute vessel closure. I think two, um, there's probably some effect from the high dose of drug that it's having on the vessel wall. I think three, um, most of these cases and, and the registers are done by high volume operators who know when to switch to stenting, right? Because in a lot of these studies, and even in you know the randomized studies we've done with de novo disease, you know when we randomize patients, we randomize them after we've done lesion preparation. And so if it looks crap and I see a big dissection, they don't get randomized to the study. I'm already stenting them. Right, so we already there's a selection bias in the in the kind of cases that end up in the randomized data. I think that's also super important. So a lot of these patients are getting their stent, and we don't know about it when there's a dissection after pre dilatation. And you know, like I said, the experience really, really helps. I mean, the one thing I I like where this is all going. I'm seeing more drug coated balloon use than I've ever seen, and I've been saying this for years, right? But when I see every presentation, and I hate to be the voice of dissent, but someone that I guess has to be, um, the one thing I feel like we're missing in all of these data, I mean, Bernard has provided some of it, we try to provide some in Bello, is I wish I would see more angiographic data for this, right? Because, you know, if you do a drug coated balloon in a two millimeter vessel and it closes, some of those you may not even know they closed. Right. Um, I mean, we really, you know, if we're going to do ACS, if we're going to do diffuse disease like Antonio's doing it, okay, I want to see angiographic data. I want to see nine months angiographic data, okay, that these vessels are still open, that they healed, uh, that they haven't closed in an asymptomatic fashion. I think we really need to be pushing for that kind of data to really convince our colleagues who are out there. That's a great yeah. answer. I well, okay, if I may add something, yeah, please, do we have please. time? Please. Yeah. We have, we have yeah, yeah. two minutes, two minutes. 
Okay, okay. It's uh, more than enough. Yeah, well, um, I agree with, um, um, with Azim that uh, we need more data like this, especially in the complex lesion setting, because uh, in uh, Piccoletto 2, in Bello, the lesion setting was, yes, was small vessel disease, which is more prone to restenosis, but uh, the, the lesion set, the lesion length was still low. Uh, we are we are uh, going to run the Picoleto 3 on this lesion setting, and we will provide the nine-month angiographic data on this. So this will be important. Um, the other point is that actually in Europe we are pushing the limits forward yeah. in terms also of lesion complexity. I cannot show you the angiographic data because I was not prepared. But uh, two days ago, uh, I had to do a nostal LED PCI by means of a four-row drug coated balloon. Uh, in a patient where I wanted to spare uh, a metal uh, in a perfect uh, left main with a big discrepancy between the left main and the LED. Okay, so it is debatable if to use a drug coated balloon in this setting, but we are doing this now. As we are doing drug coated balloon PCIs with one single antiplatelet therapy, just clopidogrel or aspirin, no other, uh, yeah. no doubt, never in patients at high bleeding risk. Wow. Uh, we will we will provide more data on this, but it will take some time. Okay, let's move on because we have so many questions. I got to get to them, but let's go to the next lecture. Real world case experience and clinical outcomes with magic touch seromas quitted balloon. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Euro PCR uh, and the Concept Medical for giving me this opportunity to share our experience uh, of magic touch. Uh, from our center. So my name is Sandeep Baswarajaya. I'm a cardiologist in Heartlands Hospital in Birmingham, United Kingdom. In this presentation, I would like to give our experience from the real world experience of magic touch, uh, serolium scored balloon and show some cases following on my conflicts of interest. So we embarked this technology of magic touch in April, 2018. And uh, so far we have used in over six, six, 650 patients. And in this presentation, I would like to give the retrospective analysis of patients treated between April 2018 up until October 2020. During this period, we had treated 533 patients and 688 lesions with magic touch. The mean age of patients were 65 years. And if you come to the demographics, most of them were male, 80%. Diabetes accounted for 40%, reflecting most of the lesions treated with magic touch were uh, small vessel diffuse disease, which are seen in diabetic patients. CKD accounted for 17% of patients, and most of them were, most of them were in the setting of uh, acute coronary syndrome, which accounted for 60%, and stable angina in 40% of patients. Coming to the procedural characteristics, de novo lesions accounted for most of the lesions, 62%. We also had 38% of patients with restenotic lesions. This is interesting. Small vessel, less than three millimeter, accounted for almost 60% of the lesions. Predilatation was achieved in 98% of uh, lesions, uh, which were mainly with the semi compliant and non compliant balloons. We had scoring cutting balloons and rotational atherectomy in uh, approximately 16% of our cases. Coming to the, uh, the lesions, most of them were in the LAD diagonal territory followed by right coronary artery and circumference system. We also had around 28 uh, lesions in vein graft and left main stem. The bailout stenting uh, was carried out in around 45 lesions, according to 7%, which are mainly due to uh, recoil in 50% of, uh, oh, sorry, recoil of more than 50% in 34 patients or 34 lesions and uh, flow limiting dissections in 11. All bailout standing were carried out with a, a second generation dolorine stent. The mean diameter of the DCB was 2.7 millimeter and mean length was 26 millimeter, indicating these were small vessel long lesions. The median follow up was 570 days, approximately 18 months. And during this median follow up, we had around 48 deaths, uh, but some of them were due to COVID uh, related deaths, especially the one which happened in 2020. Uh, but the cardiac death was low, uh, 2%, and the target of LMI was 4%. TLR per lesion and per patient were approximately 10%. The overall maze, which was defined as cardiac death, target of LMI and TLR were seen in 11% uh, of uh, cases. We had no documented cases of acute vessel closure. 
coming to the de novo subset, we had 348 patients and two 426 lesions. Uh, again, the mean diameter was smaller than the whole set of population, 2.5 millimeter, and mean length was 25 millimeter. And again, these were small vessel long lesions. The clinical outcomes in de novo population is even more uh, uh, interesting because we had a very uh, low rates of hard endpoints like cardiac death, which accounted for less than 2%, and target was lemma in 3%. TLR was 8% and the overall mass rate was 9%. So in summary, we have witnessed low rates of hard endpoints in patients treated with magic touch, acceptable rates of TLR and mass, despite a complex set of patients, like 60% of them were in the setting of ACS, 40% diabetics, and 17% patients with CKD, and the lesion subset, which were all in small vessels, long lesions. The results are encouraging, although we need more long-term data, which is currently ongoing. With this, I would like to share some cases from our center. This is a case of a 64-year-old man with a crescendo angina, and he had an inferior myocardial infarction in 2016, where he had one long drug reading stent. He came a few years later with angina, and we found that his stent was completely blocked, as you can see from here. So this was an intrastent CTO, which was uh, treated uh, or opened up with the help of a Corsair and a Gaia-3. After confirming the distal wire position from a contralateral injection, we aggressively predilated this lesion and performed an intravascular ultrasound, which essentially showed the stent was significantly undersized. Based on the IBUS data, we used 3.5 and a 4 millimeter magic touch to achieve an acceptable result. As you could see here, there is no significant recoil or any flow-limiting dissections, and hence we accepted this. And patient came back for a follow-up angiogram at six months, and you could see the vessel still open with no significant recoil. And patient was asymptomatic at this point. So the second case uh, is of a 64-year-old gentleman with uh, crescendo angina, and the angiogram had demonstrated a blocked right coronary artery, uh, which you probably can appreciate some collateral from the left system, but you also had a significant disease in the circumflex and uh, marginal system. So our plan was to treat this first and then bring him back for a stage PCI to RCA CTO. So we treated the main branch with a one ring stent, and after that, we noted that there was a significant pinching of the uh, big side branch, which is AB circumflex. And hence, we recrossed and uh, used a 2.5 by 35 millimeter magic touch. And uh, we had a result like this. Obviously, it's not as good as a stented segment, but we know that this will possibly remodel. Uh, so he came back uh, for a stage PCI to RCN three, uh, three months. And as you could see here, the side branch, which was treated with a magic touch, looked positively remodeled, uh, and the results are excellent. And uh, you can appreciate this better if you compare the post procedure um, and follow up angiogram. You could appreciate the positive remodeling. The final case is very interesting. So, this gentleman, 70 year old with inferior myocardial infarction uh, with no previous cardiac history and risk factors of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and smoking. So, left system showed a moderate to severe disease in the mid-segment of LAD, but the culprit for his presentation was the right coronary artery, which was blocked from its distal segment, very ectatic and aneurysmatic segment here, and a lot of thrombus load. So if you look at the AP cranial, you'll see here, here even more uh, uh, appreciating the aneurysm segment and a big size mismatch, and there was hardly any flow in the distal segment. So we crossed the uh, lesion first with a Sion blue wire, and we also uh, crossed a big uh, RV branch, which was subtotally occluded. We ballooned the RV branch with a, a semi-compliant balloon, and then we used a 3 by 20 millimeter magic touch to the ostium of the side branch, or the RV branch. Then we worried about putting a stent in the distal segment because one, there was a lot of thrombus load. Second, there was a big size mismatch. So we felt that we won't be able to oppose a stent here. And hence, we decided to go for a proba and a DCB. So after ballooning with a non-compliant balloon, we used two overlapping drug-coated balloons, which is a magic touch. So 3 by 15 distally and 3.5 by 20 millimeter approximately. And in the end, we had a result like this where there was a TME3 flow, no significant recoil or a dissection. We gave some integralin, which is a GP2B3 inhibitors for patient for 12 hours. And he came back in three months for an assessment of the LAD. And at this point, when we took the picture of the right contrary, we were amazed with the positive remodeling of the vessel. As you could see, it's a stimulatory flow, a 
And if you look at the AP cranial, uh, there's a significant improvement in the distal vessel caliber and also the treated segment. And hence, we didn't uh, treat this anymore, but we treated the left system. So in summary, Magic Touch appears a promising technology. Clinical outcomes from a population appears good with low rates of hard endpoints and acceptable rates of uh, MACE and uh, repeat revascularization. The results are encouraging, although we need long-term data and, center and other um, and data from other centers, which is currently ongoing. Thank you very much. That's fantastic, Sandeep. I'm going to uh, quickly ask a question because we're, again, running sh short on time. But I want to ask it to all the, the panelists. You know, uh, Sandeep shows some very complex cases, STEMI, some CTOs. Uh, uh, Bernardo just talked about stenting an osteal LA, I mean, ballooning an osteal LAV with the DCB. Where should we be going? It seems like to me we have to, what are the indications that we should be focusing on for these products first? Or should we be doing what we're doing, which is just basically using it in every lesion type, every situation, so on and so forth? I don't think they're as well studied as we're using them for all these indications. Uh, Thanks. Uh, yes. If I. Oh, no, no, okay, okay. You, you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yes, we, there is no indication for using DCB in any type of lesion setting. This would be a, a bad message now. Uh, we, we started doing PCIs. Well, our uh, magister started doing PCIs like Antonio without any type of clinical data. Uh, they started putting stents uh, with Coumadin. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of stent, stent thrombosis. So now... Now we are much more mature and we need clinical data before doing this. However, in the experience centers, you may push your limit forward. This is my belief. So if there is an advantage, a potential advantage for the patient, if you want to spare metal or too much metal in a sick patient, you can, in an experience center, push your limits forward. For the moment, we need to collect data, reliable clinical data, randomized clinical trials, in order to see if within five to six years, we will be able to also use a DCB in any type of lesion setting. This is my- Bernardo, belief. I'm gonna ask this to Sandeep as well. Do we need a randomized trial? Because you're talking about, I could put a stent in here or I could put a DCB in here. And there's sort of a random choice now. Do we need that trial, Sandeep, that's really gonna tell us in individual situations, what do we use when? I totally agree. Uh, hello, coming back to the indications of DCB, I tend to use DCB only in lesions where I don't want to put stents. So like restenotic lesions, small vessel, long lesions, patients with bleeding disorder or waiting for an urgent cancer surgery. Putting a DCB in a left pane or a proximal LED, I don't think so we have enough data to recommend that. And I'll tell you the reason why. If you do a very bad angioplasty with a stent in a left main, not sizing the properly, not doing IVERS, and patient dies in one month, and you could justify saying, oh, it's a bad luck because stent thrombosis can happen. Whereas if you do a great DCB angioplasty in a left main, with this, with IVUS and everything, and patient dies one month later, people aren't going to say, oh, it's a bad luck. They say it's a bad choice because you used a DCB in a completely unknown vessel, which is not being studied. For a large uh, vessel, I think we need to wait for the data. But small vessels, we have data. We've got data from Bello trial. We've got data from Basket Small 2, which yeah. is recently produced a long term data. So we have enough. So in my practice, I use only in small vessel, long lesions. Or patients waiting for cancer surgeries. I've, I've done in left main proximity who are urgent cancer surgery. I've just given a month of DAPT and stopped them. So that's my uh, view. Love it. Okay, let's move on to the that last talk of this excellent, excellent session. Uh, be safe, be smart. Where to use DCB in current practice? Hello, my name is Antonio Colombo, and I'm presenting from Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan. I will talk about uh, drug-coated balloon in current practice. I have no conflict to disclose. Uh, drug-coated balloon first should be utilized for instant restenosis. Uh, it's very important uh, to be aware that lesion preparation is essential before utilizing drug-coated balloon. The other desire for confirmed what I stated. Uh, if you perform angiosculpt balloon, for example, or maybe even a drug, uh, even cutting balloon, uh, you see the difference. The diameter stenosis is six months. Uh, that uh, goes from uh, uh, 35 uh, up down to uh, 18. 
uh, if uh, you use uh, a good uh, preparation uh, with uh, angioscalp compared to 32% if you do not use angioscalp and you only use uh, drug coated balloon. So essential optimal lesion preparation. This uh, is another example to uh, highlight uh, the importance of lesion preparation. Here you see a diffusing stent or stenosis, long lesions. Uh, in, for the time's sake, I just uh, highlight uh, the three steel frame of the OCT, where you see a huge amount of uh, hyperplasia. Uh, you need uh, to remove as much as possible these uh, hyperplasia in order to obtain an optimal result. And that uh, after uh, orbital aterectomy, cutting balloon and high pressure, you see the difference between pre and post with better stent expansion and less amount of uh, hyperplasia. So this is the time to use a drug coated balloon. Uh, with uh, uh, implantation of a short stent distally. So optimal lesion preparation, then a drug the balloon, the best way to treat uh, in-stent stenosis. Here are uh, some uh, steel frames. Uh, you see the baseline, uh, post-orbital arterectomy, and then further improvement, post-high pressure dilatation, and then uh, time to use drug coated balloon. So the message is clear. The drug coated balloon should only be used uh, to treat in standard stenosis if the lesion is appropriately prepared. In some situations, we published many years ago, the combination of the drug coated balloon and drug eluting stent in extreme situation of instant risk stenosis. This is 2013. We rarely do this nowadays, but some situations we do these as 57 lesion in 46 patients. Interesting, there was no case of uh, thrombosis, but the numbers are very small. But this is something uh, to keep in mind. Small vessel drug coated balloon has been uh, uh, demonstrated in the study, Bark and Small, Lancet 2018, uh, 758 patients, uh, DCB versus DES, 25% at taxus, 12 months event, no difference, so no reason to replace metal in the small vessels when you can get the same result with drug coated balloon, 7.5, 7.3. Uh, no difference in cardiac death uh, and no difference in stent thrombosis. Now we come to what I consider quite interesting and new, uh, diffuse disease and uh, long lesion treatment. I think we skip these two slides and go to this slide that highlight the fact that in a short focal lesion, death is essential, but when you have to treat a long LED diffuse disease, uh, to make this LED a full metal jacket is not appropriate. So we consider DCB with PDPA, pressure distally and proximal evaluation, and use uh, no stent if possible. So uh, stenosis in a big vessel requiring a short stent implantation is a gold standard no reason to be innovative. But when you have long diffuse disease, instead of using a long stent uh, with imaging optimization, which is not necessarily bad, uh, we propose optimal lesion preparation with PDPA evaluation, and then uh, to treat with DCB if the final gradient is less than 10 millimeter of mercury. This is a total occlusion treated with a DS proximally and too long DCB uh, distally. So no reason to reconstruct this vessel completely, only treat uh, the proximal part and then use uh, a DCB for the distal diffuse disease. Here is an LED. We implant a stent in the LED, but the diffuse disease diagonal is treated with balloon. There is a dissection, but the PDPA is 89, so only 11 millimeter of mercury uh, with a wire very distal 
uh, we accept this result and use drug coated balloon. This is a more extreme case with a long diagonal, with a lot of diffuse disease, LED, a long lesion. You can implant a stent on the LED. First, we tackle uh, the diagonal. Uh, we predilated, we did the rotablation, we did OPN 28 atmosphere, then we did drug coated balloon. Uh, there was still uh, 89 gradient distally. We did additional dilatation distally with a 2O balloon, a 1.5 balloon, and then use a U2O DCB. And after the DCB, the gradient goes to 95, so only five millimeter. And interesting, the same approach was used for the LED with no need to implant a stent in both vessels. The final gradient was only five millimeter of mercury. So I would like to conclude that by stating that DCB drug coated balloon are effective for treatment of instantaneous stenosis only after optimal lesion preparation, no compromise. DCB can be used to treat small vessels uh, and in some advantages compared to DES, such as the short dab duration. The paper in Lancet did not go into this, but it's something to keep in mind. And uh, the new approach is about utilizing an appropriate strategy for DCB uh, when uh, you you're treating long lesion and diffuse disease instead of using long stents. Thank you for your attention. In the remaining four minutes we have, I'm going to ask just a couple of questions. Um, Antonio's not here, but he's a big fan, it sounds like to me, of pressure wire guided DCB treatment. Are you all advocating that pressure wire should be used when we used a treat de novo lesions with DCBs? Number one, and I'm going to have another question. Bernardo, you're using off-label or single antiplatelet therapy after DCBs. Where did you get that idea? Do you think it's acceptable? I'd like the, audio, uh, the panelists to comment on that as well. Okay. Um, regarding the, piece, the, the, the IFR and FFR, we use it uh, very rarely, I have to say. Uh, sometimes, like in the case that Antonio just showed for long diffuse disease, uh, we use a stepwise uh, IFR, but in less than 10% of the cases uh, with DCB. Um, regarding regarding the other question, uh, well, um, uh, I would say that this is very rare as well. We usually go for DAPT for one month in case of a uh, stable patient uh, with uh, native vessel disease and for three months in case of instant restenosis. But I was mentioning that many patients suffer uh, bleeding as, as we know, the patient is uh, uh, often sick. So in this case, uh, we uh, don't think that we need a DAPT. Uh, we invented, Antonio invented DAPT uh, with ticlopidine just uh, uh, to spare the stent thrombosis after bare metal stent implantation. So uh, you have to convince me to use a second antiplatelet if I use a balloon or if I uh, add sirolimus or papitaxel. I don't see the reason. Uh, we don't have data, so we use uh, DAPT unless the patient is at high bleeding risk. In this case, we go for single. Okay. Sandeep, Azim, uh, Irene, any other comments? Yeah, so uh, I have to, I've, I'm forced to make a comment, I think, um, just to clarify. So what Antonio is doing, and I think it's really like Antonio, he's always pushing the limits and making us rethink our approach, right? We put in too many stents. I mean, and we put in, you know, the days of full metal jacket have to stop. I mean, I cringe when I see 80 millimeters of stent going into an LAD, right? Or even 60 millimeters of stent going to LAD. And the one thing BVS did for us, it created for us this flavor uh, and understanding that maybe we can treat arteries and leave nothing behind. Mm -hmm. And hopefully DCBs fill that role. All right, mm -hmm. but Antonio is doing it. He's, a, he's one of the most experienced operators in the world, okay, and he's doing it in a very careful way. He's doing, he's using IFR, FFR in diffuse disease, 
okay, to understand that he's gotten a good angiographic result and hopefully minimizing the risk of acute occlusion. And remember, I mean, using PD, I mean, PDPA to decide if it was, if the vessel was properly treated was invented by Grunzig, okay? This is not, I mean, this is as old as it becomes, right? Uh, and so he's using it in that way. There are data for FFR uh, and in DCBs. Uh, and if you look at the consensus document we wrote with our German colleagues, we say it's one of the ways you can decide if you have an optimal result after DCB and whether you need a stent, because it's not only a question of acute vessel closure, but it is a question of uh, of also giving the patient optimal results, right? I mean, right now in the US, we're about to start GPS defined, uh, who Alan Jeremiah and Greg Stone are, run, are running, where we're going to use now pressure-wise to decide if we implanted stents properly, okay? Because there's good data saying that a pressure wire at the end of the procedure, if the physiology is not corrected, you may not have great, great outcomes. I think when it comes to dual, the dual antiplatelet therapy question, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I admire Bernard for pushing again the limit, the, uh, the Bernardo, sorry, for pushing the limits, and I hope he's going to show us data, and I hope even more he'll show us a randomized trial, okay, to show us that you know there's no difference. But already, I think if he shows us a hundred patients where he's given only clopidogrel. And, you know, the patients understand what he's doing and he's, they've consented to having single antiplatelet therapy after the artery is treated and we have that data. It may be enough for us and for Bernardo to kind of get the support to do a good randomized trial. But, you know, we have to be, we live in a, maybe I've, I've, I've come to America and I've become a little soft, uh, but, uh, you know, the world of litigation in medicine is very real. And we can, you know, and maybe America's kind of made me realize how easily you can get sued Azim. if you actually don't have clinical data to support what you do. Azim, you become yeah, like me. Yeah, been, but uh, uh, if I may reply to these. Uh, <laughs> we got to yeah. run in two minutes, Bernardo, make it really short. We're already over. Yeah, yeah, very fast. I agree with Azim that we need clinical data. However, real life is different because real life, uh, in real life, you have a patient with 7.6 of hemoglobin, which needs a PCI. What do you do? You implant a stent. No, you prefer a DCB. In this case, I don't add to the bleeding the risk of putting two antibiotic therapy. So this is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I'm doing PCI with DCB with only yeah. one single antiplatelet. But in some cases, I would say 20 cases or 25 per year, we do this. And we are happy of doing this, and we will ne never have in this setting any reliable clinical data. Azim, you need yeah, 10 years, and then you'll, you'll get used to this. May I add something? Uh, lost it. I've been used to it for a long time, trust me. Sorry, anything else? I've got to, we've got to close the session, right? Yeah, Aloke, can you hear me? I'm yes. here, Gianluca. Yeah. Yes, hi, thank you. Hi. Just to add to uh, what Bernardo was saying, uh, maybe uh, it's not the, the presence of the second antiplatelet, but the extension. I mean, some of the, uh, of the, of the issues come uh, after uh, one month, three months. So uh, the drug body balloon technology allows us to uh, shorten the, the, the DAPT, and this is a, a already a, a very good goal. Uh, and just to uh, just to uh, come back to the lesion subset, uh, I think our osteal lesion we we are, we are not um, ready to to treat those kind of lesions with DCB where um, radial force uh, has still a, a, an important role in those kind of uh, lesions. So I think uh, 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 that intracoronary imaging also uh, not only. Uh, the, the physiological assessment could uh, uh, give some uh, um, answers in the in this field. Fantastic. Great last comment. With that, I'd like to close the session. Thank all of the panelists, the speakers. Excellent. We had a great session. Thank the audience. They've been so clued in. I mean, they've been fantastic. Over 39 questions were posted on the chat box. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone and hope everyone has a great rest of their day and evening. Thanks.